I've been thinking lately about this idea that a VNA is the foundation of a data lake and really can be part of a, uh, the data lake ecosystem. And I want to talk about how to do that. I'm going to use Amazon's definition of a data lake to kind of describe how a VNA fits into that. And I'm also going to show a demonstration of actually doing this with CouchDB and a real VNA. When I talk about VNA, I'm usually talking about supporting transactional and operational information systems. These can include things like your PACs, EMR, the RIS, uh, other documentation system, dose management systems, and so forth, right? Uh, this data might be coming from their modalities. It could be injectors. It could be the radiologist dictating a report, et cetera, et cetera. But all of those systems are generating this sort of, you know, this, this data, this rich data set. But in a VNA, while we're storing the entire data set, we have to curate fields that are important that we can use to support those operations in the most efficient way. So we typically use uh, some kind of a fixed schema, right? A structured fixed schema, and we store that information in a relational database, essentially, right? So we're taking this unstructured data and we're storing it in the structured database that's aggregating the data across the entire organization. And I would argue that once we're aggregating structured data, what we really have is a data warehouse. Right. So a VNA really under the hood is sort of representing a data warehouse with that extra piece that it's also storing all of the original unadulterated data. Right. All the, the original copies of that data in a vendor neutral format. It does other things which we're going to talk about here in just a bit. Now, what is a data lake? Right. We know what a data warehouse is, but what's a data lake? A data lake is basically a platform where you can store all of your original files. Right. So according to the Amazon definition, it's something that can scale to any size for storing data in its original format, both structured and unstructured data. It's all going to get collected into this big storage engine. Now, one of the problems with a data lake, it's sort of like I know that everybody in their kitchen has that one drawer, the junk drawer, where you just put anything and you have no idea what's in there. We have the same problem with the data lake, right? It can become a data swamp. If we don't know what's in there, we can't really get any meaningful information out of it, right? We can't get any insight if we don't know how to use it, if we don't know what's actually available to us in the data lake. So to solve that problem, we add a data catalog. So you have your data lake, which is coupled with a data catalog. It's an important component. You cannot have a data lake without cataloging it. And how do you catalog a data lake? Basically what you're doing is you're taking all of the raw information that's in that data lake and you're crawling it and creating data structures to store information about it. Uh, those data structures could be XML and they could be JSON. What's distinct about these data structures from a regular database, right? A standard database is very structured, whereas JSON and XML and so forth, when they're stored with things like NoSQL, they're flexible, meaning there's no schema. Of course, XML can have somewhat of a schema with things like XSLT or DTTs even, but it's not the same, right? It's uh, it's very flexible in that you can have different kinds of XML documents describing different kinds of data. Um, it's massively scalable. And most importantly, because we're storing all the metadata, not just things that we curate and have to put into fixed columns in a database, we're storing everything about that data that we know, it becomes discoverable, right? It becomes much more meaningful and discoverable. And we can do more interesting things if we know what's in that data lake by being able to search it and being able to mine that data lake. Who is gonna use the data lake? So once we have this catalog and we have our data lake, generally you're gonna have things like data scientists, uh, business analysts, data developers. They're gonna use that catalog to find you know, to basically find data, and then they're going to use some kind of an API to consume that data from the data lake. So one of the defining attributes about a data lake is it not only stores all that data, but it has standard ways to go and get that data out of the data lake. Hopefully, if you're following along here, you're starting to see a lot of parallels to VNA, right? At least on the data lake side. So again, we're going to support those data analysts and those data scientists and so forth. But what we're not going to really worry about with the data lake and with this catalog is we're not really thinking about operational support, right? We're not thinking about supporting these transactional and operational information systems. Uh, that stuff is already done, right? The VNA is already handling that. We're talking about this trying to gain insight from our data for our data scientists, our business analysts, and our developers and so forth, and being able to access all that data. However, data lake not only supports those people, but it's also the foundation to support artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? Because now artificial intelligence and machine learning can use that catalog and they can use the access to all of that data to gain even more insight 
uh, and they can do more prescriptive analytics, right? They can start to do, more, you know, that sort of next level of analytics can start happening uh, and that next level of AI and so forth. So all this new and exciting stuff can happen, again, by laying that foundation by having a data lake with a catalog to make that data useful. Now, let's take a look at back at the VNA world, right? A VNA really, it's got a whole bunch of data. It's got a data warehouse, as I described earlier. We're supporting things like packs that are storing DICOM, the EMR and the RISC storing HL7. We got documents going in uh, that, that are being stored with XDS. You've got dose management systems storing DICOM. Then you got all of this myriad of other non-DICOM data sets like photos and videos and telemetry data and CDAs and so forth, right? All of this non-DICOM you know, data that we can store in a VNA or hopefully that your VNA can store, right? That's a standard part that of, of a VNA is being able to store not just DICOM, but all these different data sets. So we've got this, this VNA sitting there. VNA now, of course, is more than just storing that data, right? So storing data in some, you know, neutral format, right? And its original form is certainly a really important part of a VNA. It's also that index that we talked about. It's also going to have interoperability. So it's gonna offer a variety of standards to interface to it, to get access to that data and to query for that data. Um, it's gonna support um, security. So it's gonna have you know, some consent management or something where it's gonna prevent people from accessing data that they're not supposed to be able to access, right? And be able to configure that. You've got this idea of multi-tenancy where all these different departments are sharing one big VNA, right? Which is something that makes VNA very, uh, very much useful as being able to share it across the entire enterprise. Uh, and then you've got all the sort of day-to-day -day data management tools like prefetching and routing and lifecycle management and tag morphing and all that sort of thing. But what if we added on to a VNA? What if not only supporting those operations, what if we also had a catalog like I described with a data lake? So this would be something like Hadoop or Mongo or CouchDB, some NoSQL database engine. And it turns out that a VNA has standards that can help us support something like CouchDB. You know, a VNA can output an IAN message, right? Image instance availability notification. You can take that information to go back and find and consume JSON objects that describe the objects that are under management or under storage of the VNA. It'll do that. Most VNAs will give you a JSON object when you ask it for one, right? And say, here's everything that we know about this particular data set. And that doesn't come from that structured database. It comes from the file itself. It's going into that file and outputting this sort of document. And then we can add that document to our catalog, right? So the document that describes that data gets added to that catalog and can be indexed and crawled by that catalog. Um, likewise, if somebody changes data, for example, maybe they delete an image in a study, right? That would generate an IOCM message, which could tell us that an image is no longer in a study. And then that tells us to go and remove that document that references that so that we know that that unreferenced study is no longer referenced by our data catalog, right? Um, so in this example, you can see that whether it's AI and machine learning or data scientists and analysts and so forth, they now can use that data catalog to sort of do that deep data mining uh, and, and try to find that information they're looking for that isn't necessarily available in that structured database. And they have an API to go and get those original objects when they're needed. Uh, if they you know, needed to do some processing or what have you, right? So they're gonna curate the data with that catalog and then they're gonna go and consume it with that API. And what you really have here is on the left, you've got data, on the right, you've got a catalog. And you know, looking at those previous slides about what describes a data lake, really, in my opinion, what the VNA is doing is really that data lake component. As long as you couple it with a catalog, right? You have this sort of rich set of tools that allow you to get insight from your data. And when you, just, when you combine that data lake and a catalog, is that a data log? Interesting. Um, so I'm going to show you a, a, an example of this. I, I'm going to use CouchDB with a VNA that's going to output IAN messages from DICOM. It's going to output IOCM. We're going to see how it's managing that data in CouchDB. And I'm going to show you an example of some data that I could mine by using that catalog and going getting the images to get some interesting insight, for example. So in this demonstration, I've installed CouchDB, uh, which is a little free open source NoSQL database engine. It uses JSON to store all of your objects. And we're going to use this to store all of the metadata about everything that's under management of AVNA. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. 
You can see I created a database called Enterprise Imaging and there's nothing in that database yet. Now what you're looking at here is the configuration on the VNA itself. You can see that for, I created a device called 8 underscore Lake, just my test device. Uh, so I made a little SCP, a little listener for DICOM that's going to be able to receive the IAN and IOCM messages, which you can see are checked off on this list. So that means anything that gets sent to this VNA, it's going to send information about what was sent uh, using an IAN message uh, to this SCP. And anytime somebody makes a change, for example, deletes an image in a study, it's going to send an IOCM. So we'll know when new images or objects are added and we'll know when they're received or when they're removed. All right, next let's give this a try. So you can see I have no documents in my NoSQL database, my um, my enterprise imaging database that's in my uh, in my CouchDB server. So my next step is I've got a couple applications here. One is uh, this these files here are just DICOM files that I'm going to send. And the way I'm going to send these DICOM files, they're just ultrasound uh, DICOM files. The way I'm going to send those is I'm just going to use Store SCU. It's a free utility from the Office Toolkit DCMTK. And I'm just going to try to send all those files to the VNA. And the VNA is then going to send IAN messages. And this window over here on the left is I've got a listener uh, uh, listening for IAN messages. This is going to log what it's doing. So what it should do is every time it receives an IAN, it's going to go out and do a WADO call. So a DICOM web WADO RS call to the VNA, get a JSON object of all the metadata for the images, right? So everything you would want to know about an image right and then it's going to it's going to add that document that json document to the couchdb server which is then going to be discoverable right somebody could use that to find information so when i come over here you can see it started sending the files and you can see over here it's already starting the process so it did a wado rs call you can see the url and if i go into my database and reload this page you can already see documents are being created if I reload it again, we see another document. So it's going to keep creating these documents. Now, this is just a proof of concept. So certainly it's going to run a little bit slower than perhaps, uh, you know, in a real implementation. When I click on these in the database, you can see it's the full metadata. It's everything that we know about that DICOM file with the exception of the pixel data. What's interesting is in this list, you know, in this information, you can see there's a pointer. So if somebody were in this NoSQL or CouchDB database or any other uh, you know, non-relational database, uh, looking at these documents, they would actually see a link they could go to to go and download those physical images, whether it's AI or it's a researcher or a data scientist, anyone who's using this database and doing some uh, some searching, they could go and find those actual files. So they would be able to query and, uh, and sort and, and discover data based on anything that's in that DICOM header again with the exception of the pixel data but they could still use this uri that's included to go out and get that pixel data if they wanted to so i'm back on the vna and now that we have all these documents that were stored that came from you know somebody sent some images we have them in the vna what if somebody makes a change to something in the vna so that's the next step is we have to handle changes so let's say they deleted an image or deleted a study so i'm going to go in here and i'm going to click on delete and you'll see a little dialogue comes up here just warning me. I'm going to go ahead and click OK on here. And it's going to delete these studies. Now, once that server begins to delete, you're going to see on the right-hand side, my, uh, my SCP is going to receive the IOCM messages. Right? It's uh, basically telling us which images were deleted or which objects were deleted. And then on the left-hand side is just some logging where you're going to see what it's doing with each one of those IOCMs. It's going to look in the file. So you're going to find out which the, which um, instance UID, SOP instance UID is being, being deleted, and it'll go and remove that document from CouchDB so it's no longer there. It's not discoverable anymore because we don't have those images anymore. If there were a change, it could also update, uh, which we can also do, right? So, and I can show you that. We can actually, you know, every time a new image comes in or if an image replaces a previous image or someone makes a change to the metadata, it can also do updates. So we should see on the right hand side, now that I've deleted that study, you're going to start to see that IOCM message come in and you'll actually see the file. It'll store the file in this directory that I have behind it. And then of course our handler should start handling those uh, IOCMs. Now you can see the IOCM came in, the handler over here is running. And if I go over and take a look at my files over here, I'm going to reload and they're all gone. 
So it did the updates. Uh, now, if uh, somebody had sent a new image, uh, it would add that document. If somebody made a change and uh, you know a new version of that file came in, of course, it would just replace that old document with the new one. Um, so lots of flexibility there. Now I went ahead and restored all of my data, right? Prior, I just deleted everything, but I just sent some studies again and uh, rebuilt my my little couch DB here from the uh, by the VNA sending IANs. Um, now this is kind of neat. You can see how there's so much data in here, but the question becomes, how do, can we actually use that data? So just as a quick demonstration, again, this is just really kind of a proof of concept here, um, but basically, and I'll move this window so it's a little easier for you to see. But if I wanted to do a query, um, this is just a very simple PowerShell function that connects to, uh, to uh, CouchDB and runs a query. In this example, I'm looking for the term Epic, right, which is a certain software version on Philips ultrasounds. Uh, so I'm just checking to see if I can find anything with that software revision. Maybe I'm doing some research or I'm trying to find out which machines have a certain software version. Um, maybe I have to do some updates, right? So even operationally, you could use this information. This is something you would never find in a PAX database or in a VNA, right? Because we don't index that data. It's not in a data warehouse per se, but it's in that metadata somewhere kind of locked away. So now it's discoverable. And when I run that, it just kind of goes off and does the query. Um, but then how can I actually, you know, find the results here? So I just wrote a little bit of code here and I'll just move this down so you can see it. Um, basically, it's going to loop through the results. So it's going to do the search. It's going to set the search to a variable. It's going to run through each row of that search and I'm going to output some DICOM tags. So I'm going to output the uh, accession number, the software revision number, the serial number of the machine that has that software revision, uh, the transducer, right? So I can actually figure out exactly what transducer uh, was used to create the study so I know kind of what's probably on that particular machine uh, and even a link to go and look at the actual image if I want to if I want to see that image uh, I can get that Watt ORS uh, link so let's run that and you can see here uh, for every image it found that had Epic as the uh, software to, uh, it, you know Epic appeared somewhere in the software revision uh, it gave me the serial number it's giving me the transducer information uh, the processor function that was used and of course the URI that I can go and uh, go and get that data from the VNA, right? You can actually go get the pixel data and it doesn't necessarily have to even, even be DICOM. You can do a uh, some miter change to that URI and you can go and get a JPEG image, right? That isn't even a DICOM image if, uh, if the WaterRS service supports that, which most of them do if it's a VNA. So you can see here that I've made some data discoverable that really wouldn't ordinarily be in a VNA itself, right? We wouldn't normally see any of this information. So it's immensely useful to be able to go and index this somewhere and be able to access some of this data. I've shown here kind of operationally how it could be useful, but it could be useful in a lot of other ways, especially with research, data scientists and so forth. It really unlocks and makes discoverable all of this rich information about our data that's not really operationally available in the VNA itself typically. So hopefully what you've seen in this video is hopefully that if you are if you feel like you could benefit from a data lake, if you have a VNA that supports XDS, so it can store anything in its original format, one of the first requirements for a data lake, and if your VNA can support IOCM and IAN, which can help you integrate to a catalog, uh, then theoretically you'd be able to create your own data catalog to use with the VNA, and you would have a data lake. Um, so that's kind of the purpose here. I have another short video on the last slide, if you're still with me, <laughs> and, uh, that's great, and uh, and you can take a look at that other video. It's about 30 minutes where I get into more detail in case you wanted to try this proof of concept on your own. I show you the code and just show you how I whip that up with CouchDB. Um, it doesn't matter what VNA you have, it'll work on any VNA that supports those standard. Uh, so that's it, thanks for watching. So I just wanna give you a kind of a quick overview of how I put together this demonstration, kind of a look under the hood if you're still with me here. Um, I know most people watching this video probably turned it off a while ago, <laughs> right? Um, but basically uh, what I did is I downloaded CouchDB from Apache, right? And when you download it, you go to uh, localhost colon 59, you know, port 5984 forward slash underscore utils. Now, if you just go to, to port 5984, um, and I'll show you here, right? So here's the... Uh, the URL that I'm in right now, but I'm just going to use 5984, and that's just going to uh, bring up a, like a status of your server. It'll give you like some of the parameters for your server. 
um, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Instead, let's look at utils. This is kind of how you manage your, your database engine. Now, you could go in here and start using this. You can create your database and so forth, but I needed to figure out how to do everything programmatically, right? Um, so I decided just to use PowerShell because it's a nice, easy tool to, to use. It's got a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff I can just kind of do a little bit of everything with PowerShell, right? Um, so I found this PowerShell library called PS Couch DB. This is basically how I built my proof of concept. I just built it with PS Couch DB uh, under the hood, you know, doing these commands to work with the, uh, with the engine. So I'm going to bring up um, my PowerShell ISE, and I'm going to kind of show you some of, uh, some of what I did here in uh, in PowerShell, kind of how I how I set all this up and how I ran this. So to work with my CouchDB server from the PowerShell, uh, according to the documentation, first I had to enable my cluster, right? Which I think I had actually already done, but I guess it didn't hurt to run this. I can even run it now; it doesn't really seem to hurt anything. Um, I guess it just tells you that your cluster is already running, and then I. Um, I was able to run this command, which basically shows me the configuration for my uh, CouchDB server, um, which is great, but I need to also see a list of my databases. So this command showed me my databases. I only have two right now, Replicator and Users. They're the built-in databases that come with the platform. So I wanted to create my own database called Enterprise Imaging uh, instead of using one of the other ones, right? Um, so I click to run that, and now if I go back up here and run the other command, you can see Enterprise Imaging is now a database. Now, I did learn that if you put uppercase letters in here, it fails, so don't make that mistake. Um, you have to keep it relatively simple, all lowercase letters. I don't think you can start with a number. There's a couple other little rules that are in the documentation. But um, So I create my database. Next, I wanted to start inserting data into you know documents. And in the PowerShell, we generally work with things as objects, right? We generally work with objects in PowerShell. So I created a patient object. It was basically everything you would want to know about a patient, right? But what I did is, um, you know, it's basically the kinds of things that you would that you would get if uh, you had got, you know, if you had an HL7 message. So it's kind of a, trying to approximate what you might get as far as a data structure if you had uh, uh, gotten all this from an HL7 message. And then you can see in this line right here, um, PowerShell's got a pretty cool command that will convert any object in PowerShell into a JSON uh, document, right? So if I run this it's going to create that it's going to take that patient object that i created i have two of them here patient and patient two and it creates that sort of patient object right so if i look at the contents of dollar data you can see and I'll, I'll move this up so you can see more of it right so you can see that it uh that's a json object right and this is what you can natively insert into a um you know into a couch db right into couch db is it has to be a json document um, so that's what this command here does. It's going to insert this new document into enterprise imaging. Um, and I'm going to call it, uh, I'll call it patient one and I'm going to use data to do that. So I'm going to run that. All right. So that should have inserted my document and then I'm going to do a patient two. I have to come up here and create that other object, right? So first create the object or the, the JSON document. Then here I'm going to submit that document to my couch DB server. And it looks good, right? And if I come down here, I can actually get the identifier for those documents, right? So my document ID is patient one and patient two. But to work with these, a lot of times you need to know their, their rev number, right? Um, but you can also just go and get the information, right? Um, so for example, uh, what do I call the first one? Patient one, right? So I'm going to go and get the contents of patient one from my server, right? And I put it into my doc and then I can come down here and I can look at some of the stuff in that document right so you can see here's my documents ID here's the revision number that I could use to modify it later on or remove that document later on if I need to right um, so I can reference it by the ID but I have to manage it by the rev number and then if I go down here I can also do a search right so for example if I wanted to search for records that contain my email address I'll just run this so I can run my search and it's going to output. Now, this is a very basic search. I'm just looking for that pattern anywhere in the in the JSON document. But in theory, you could also uh, they have uh, you can use a language called Mango. Um, I don't really know Mango too well yet. I've been kind of playing around with it, but you can use Mango to do more more structured queries, right? Kind of like you would do with a SQL Server, but a little bit different because it's JSON, right? But 
um, but you can do that. So you could actually put specific fields. You could say, I'm looking for a specific field that contains this value or is equal to this value. So it's not just a plain text search across the entire document, but enough to get us started, right? So the next step is I have to figure out how to get that JSON object from the VNA, right? And the easy way to do that is to just ask for it with WattoRS, right? Which natively supports JSON. Um, so as an example, first I have to build a URL, right? Uh, my particular VNA, this is the base for the URL as defined in the standard. They said, you know, you have to get the base from the uh, documentation for your device and then you can build the rest using the UIDs. So I have my UIDs right here. I know what the study UID is. So I'm gonna copy that. So the first element's gonna be studies and then that UID, then you need series and I'll paste in that UID. And then finally, instances. You gotta make sure you spell it right, otherwise it won't work, <laughs> right? All right, so instances. And then the last step here is all the way on the end of this URL, you just add metadata. And that basically is telling the service that all you want is the metadata, and that's it. And that whole thing's gonna have to be in quotes because this is a string, not a, uh, you won't understand what a URL is here yet. So then we can use a command, the wget command, uh, and we can pass wget the URI, and in this case, the URI is going to be literally the variable URI, right? And if I run that, this should work. It should go out to that server and bring back a payload, right? Now, how do I look at that payload? So, of course, you're gonna have to uh, create some kind of a, uh, I'm gonna call mine request response, so I'm going to create a variable to hold that response. I'm just going to run that. So I get it back, and here's the problem is, uh, is it's got to be an object in that, right? So if I hit the dot and I want to do content, right? That seems like it should work. I should be able to see the content. But you'll see what you get is it's actually just encoded, right? So that's not really going to help us too much. We need a string. Uh, I had to do a little bit of Googling around. But what I figured out is that this right here, uh, this will get us back the string uh, from that content. Um, raw data kind of works, right? I'll show you though, if we do uh, raw data, um, you're gonna see the JSON string come back, which makes a lot of sense. The problem is this has your headers, right? This has all the, uh, the raw data contains all of the HTTP response details, uh, which you're not gonna want. If I scroll up, you'd be able to see it if I ever get there, but I don't wanna waste a lot of time. Um, but this is probably the best way to do it because otherwise you have to filter out all of that other stuff. But once you do this, I'll highlight these two lines here. So this should give me back this JSON string, right? So now I have the JSON without all that special formatting. And now I can use that handy little function that's built in the PowerShell that converts a string that's in JSON format into an object, right? So I can work with it. So if I run that, now I can actually see what's in that file. So for example, uh, dollar DCM JSON. I'm going to get, uh, let's see, I should be able to get the patient's name, right? Let's see if that works. And it's my daughter, right? This is demo data is my, my daughter's wrist ultrasound. And her name comes right up, right? Pretty much any DICOM tag I'm looking for. It's kind of neat though. You can not just show the value, you can also get the VR, right? So it, it, it gives you both, right? So PN is the VR. Um, so that's how I'm able to get that data. And then finally, once I know I've got some valid JSON, so if I'm logging, I'd probably want to output, you know, okay, here's the patient and all that. But one thing I do need to do is uh, I have to give the document a unique name and the field that's probably most unique is going to be the, uh, the instance UID, right? So if I get back the instance UID, there we go. There's my there's my instance U, my SOP instance UID. So I'm going to end up using that as my uh, as the document name, and then finally I'm going to do new dash CouchDB document. I have to pass it a database name, which is going to be enterprise imaging. I'm going to pass it a uh, I think it's going to be a document name. So I'm going to call this, uh, I'm just going to copy and paste here. 
And then I also need the, uh, the actual data for my document, right? So that's just gonna be the, the DCM JSON. And then finally, authorization. And in my case, it's gonna be uh, admin, admin. Kept it nice and simple, right? So let's see if it uh, submits that document. We get an error here. I cannot convert value to type system.string. So it's complaining about something in my uh, in my JSON, I imagine. Oh, you know what? It's gonna be this. I probably have to sometimes, uh, that will not be evaluated with, as a string unless I do it this way, right? So I think it'll work if I do that. Uh, and now it looks like uh, two JSON is failing. Oh, uh, it's the string I want, right? Remember, it's uh, this is going to accept a string that's formatted as JSON. It doesn't want a uh, this this function doesn't want an actual JSON. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't want an object in PowerShell. It wants a string. So let me try it like that. There we go. That worked. Uh, so there's the revision number for the document that it inserted. And there's the document ID. And if I come over here and I'm going to, now one thing I realized is that you have to refresh this page a lot because uh, it logs you out. So then you have to log back in, but there's my document, right? And there's the two patient documents I created earlier. So there's my document, um, which is all the DICOM details. Here's that patient that I added previously, right? And you can see all the information in there. So that worked. So I was able to uh, create a document. Now in the real world, what would I have to do here? I would have to read that from an IAN. So I'm gonna show you the actual function that I used, which is here. So this function, they're not function really, just a uh, little script I wrote here. Uh, it's gonna get the base URL. Um, it's gonna monitor a directory for the IAN message. Now I have to say I did fake this a little bit. It was a pain in the neck to set up a listener for IAN using the Office Toolkit. So I went ahead and uh, I just kind of simulated that uh, by, by uh, whenever I send data to the VNA, I had it output a uh, file using a tag morph script, which is essentially kind of, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just not reading an actual IAN from an nCreate, a DICOM nCreate. Um, the store SCP utility doesn't, doesn't really receive nCreates, right? So that doesn't work. But uh, con conceptually, this works, right? Um, and then I just have it go and log some fields that we're going to be creating. It checks to see if there's already a document. And if there isn't, it creates a new one or a, I'm sorry. And if it, if there is, then it tries to edit the one that's already there and now put some logging and that's it. So it's just going to monitor that folder. So if I remove all this stuff, we can actually see this work. If I, uh, if I go ahead and send a case, uh, which I'll do in the next uh, section here. So to send my new files to the VNA, I'm gonna run this command that you see on my screen. I just use the store SCU command. It's from the Office Toolkit. Um, you can see I indicate the A title that I'm calling from, calling to, use the dash V option so I can see lots of information here in the screen. Now when I send that it, on the VNA, I've just got a tag morph script that's outputting what is essentially a kind of a stubbed a IAN object, right? It's I, I don't have anything that can, that can process and end create. I didn't want to write anything, so I just kind of uh, simulated this. So you'll see those IAN files get created in the uh, in this in this directory up here behind it as it sends them, right? So let me go ahead and run this. Uh, it says here it's missing the uh, the file. Oh, um, I forgot the uh, port number. Let's see, the port number is going to be 104. There we go. So it's sending all the files. And you can see it created all my little IAN files over here that I'm going to read to uh, to go and create the uh, um, these documents, right? So back here, you can see I don't really have any documents yet, right? But I'm going to go into my PowerShell. And when I run this, it should try it. I'll, I'll make this bigger so you can see it. But it's going to go and find each one of those files and try to generate the uh, document for us. So let's let this run. So you can see it found the first one, it's created a document, it's looking at the second one, 
And now I'm going to come back over here and reload this page, which almost always fails because <laughs> you have to you get logged out. But you can see it's creating those uh, those objects now, right? So it's pretty cool. It works, right? Uh, receive IOCM objects, right? Um, so the easy way to do that is the store SCP command. Um, I'm going to run it in dash D for debug mode. And then I also, um, I want to make sure I, so IOCM are KOS objects and, and um, store SCP doesn't receive them by default. So I had to make my own config file to make sure I could receive those. So it's right here, key object uh, storage, right? Um, you have to accept that in order for this to work. So um, I just created my own store SCP. So I have to reference that from the command. So uh, to do that, it's the uh, dash dash uh, config. Actually, I can't remember, so I'm just going to run this, and it'll tell us here, right? So the option in here for the config file, so dash dash config file, right? Uh, and we want the dash d command for debug mode. So it should be pretty straightforward. So dash 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 d dash dash config dash file. And my config file, uh, where did I put it? It should be... In my demo directory here, so store sp.config and the profile I need is the default profile that I put in there. I'm going to tell it to listen on port 4444, which is how I configured it in my VNA, so that when somebody deletes something, it's going to use port 4444. Um, so that's it. So that's listening. So now I can go and delete some images, and those images, after it gets deleted, uh, the IOCM files are going to flow into this directory over here. So you'll see it receive and then flow over here. All right, so I went and deleted those images. So any second now, we should start seeing these uh, IOCM, uh, or the one IOCM object uh, come over, and we'll see it get created over here. So let's give it a second here. All right, there it goes. There's our IOCM object. And now we have to do something with it, right? So now we actually have to work with that file. Well, it turns out that there's a nice little command in uh, in the uh, DCMTK. Again, it's a free little toolkit, but this free command will let you, um, let's see, DCM to JSON, right? Because the format that we want is JSON. Uh, and you just have to pass it the path to the file. So in my case, uh, that file is going to be here in IOCM. So if I run this, there you go. It outputs JSON, right? And it's in the exact same format uh, that we wanted, right? So now, of course, I need to uh, create a variable to hold that, right? So I'll call it IOCM, and I have to put this in parentheses. Now, one thing that's uh, kind of annoying is you do have to add the dash Q option or else it injects any warnings or errors, which will ruin our day. Um, but now I should have a string, right? This IOCM string should be the JSON object that I'm after, right? There it is. And I'm going to create a JSON object by calling the... Uh, convert from JSON command, right? So convert from JSON is going to basically give me an object that I can work with. Uh, so the input object is going to be IOCM, right? Uh, let's see, it needs this to be a string. So I think if I put a string in front of this to typecast it, just to make sure and then we run this again, ha, it worked that time, right? So now we should have an object that we can work with. And if we look at, uh, let's see, I think this was gonna be, um, I should be able to work with it directly. So I, if I look at, uh, let's think of a DICOM tag here. So 0008, 0018, that's the instance UID. I should be able to get a value from that. Oh, uh, I forgot it. It's got to be uh, IOCM JSON, right? I was using the wrong. There we go. So there it is. There's our instance UID, right? 
um, or at least, uh, yeah, the one instance UID. So now I should be able to, uh, once I have that, uh, that value, I should be able to go and construct a message that's going to, um, or construct something to get rid of it, right? So I want to do a delete, basically. So I want to remove from CouchDB a document, right? And the database from which I'm going to remove this document is going to be enterprise uh, imaging, I think, right? And then the document name, I'm looking at my notes over here. Um, it's basically going, well, we have to get, it's going to be the UID, right? So in this case, it's going to be this. Right, if you recall, I had to put that dollar sign on there to, so it treats it the right way. And then uh, authorization, just the same as before, it's just admin, admin, because I made mine nice and easy, easy to log in. Let's see if that works. Oh, you have to pass in a revision number, right? So somehow you have to get that revision number in order to pass it in. But the basic concept here is that this will work, right? This will let us delete that object. Um, but what I want to do, let's go back to our file here. So there's my one IOCM object. So what I want to do is uh, come back over here and show you the script that I wrote. And basically what it's going to do, it's going to read in the file. It is then going to, uh, for each UID that is in, so it's going to find the UIDs. Now what I had to do here is the actual UIDs that are going to be deleted are are kind of buried in a sequence in DICOM. You have to go all the way down to this level. So that's why you see this JSON object is kind of buried all the way down. If you look in the actual JSON object that we got back, uh, there's the actual UID. Oops, let me go back up. There's the actual UID that we're going to delete, right? But it's buried inside this tag, which is buried inside this tag, which is, you know, buried inside another tag, right? So I kind of had to follow that path in the JSON to build that path. And basically for each one of those it finds, it's going to go ahead and do a delete. So if I run this, and let me just go back over here, right, like right now, and as usual, I get logged out every time I abandon this for just a minute. There's probably a setting somewhere. All right, so right now, I've got a whole bunch of documents in here, right? Uh, and if I run this script over here, it should go and try to delete those. So now if I reload over here, they should all be gone. And there they go. They're gone. Right? So IOCM works. So that's how I was able to handle the IOCM. So I showed, I demonstrated DICOM data, but what about all the other data that you might have? You know, anything really could be in this catalog in CouchDB, right? Or Mongo or whatever, whichever one you happen to be using, right? Um, so I wanted to kind of experiment with some other data types. Now we could have done XDS, but it's a lot of work for me to set up a, uh, an XDS registry and a repository and all that. But the concept is really the same, right? It's just, it's all, you know, web services, right? With XDS. Um, but just to show some other concepts, I, I, I have here a bunch of other document types that we might have that we might want to index. Um, for example, here, I just have a plain text report. So how did I handle a plain text report and get that into CouchDB to make it yet something else that we can index? Well, my approach was, is uh, I just get the raw content, right? Of that text file create my own little JSON object from it, right? So I get the uh, that data. Of course, this is telling me that, uh, oh, I forgot my slash in here, right? Helps to have the right path. So now if I look at, um, if I run this next line, it should create my little JSON object, which is gonna be really basic, right? Just gonna have the contents of the report wrapped in JSON, and I should be able to add that to my database. So I'm gonna run that, and if I come over here and reload this page hopefully it didn't log me out already there it is there's my text report right and it's again it's indexed in CouchDB the other option or the other uh, type of file that I had I was playing with is um, this is kind of a weird one this is a uh, and I'll just use the office uh, XML editor here this is a um, an XML but it was this weird transitional HL7 I happen to have one of these laying around where uh, you take an HL7 2.x message and you just encode the, uh, um, you know, the segments and the, 
and the elements right here, you know, into XML. So it's really basic. But again, not that hard to, to put this in a CouchDB because all I got to do is somehow convert the XML, right? So, which I did here, right? So there happens to be a convert from XML function that uh, somebody wrote. And I put a little shout out to them right here. That's where I found the function. I just did a Google search for convert from XML, right? So this converts from XML uh, and converts and I just, you know, I'm piping this stuff along, basically piping it until I can get convert to JSON to work, right? Um, and I just did a depth of eight to make sure it works. So in this example, um, if I run this, I'll just run this first portion here. It should convert that XML into a JSON object or a JSON document rather. So if I look, it's now JSON, right? So now I can go ahead and insert that into my little database. Come back over here and we'll take a look. And it's right there. Oops, that's the text report. There's my HL7 base report, right? So now it's in there. And what's nice about doing it this way, I could have just made it a blob of text, right? But by structuring it like this, uh, it, it kind of helps somebody who wants to do pointed queries, right? Where they're looking for certain values in certain fields um, for whatever project they're doing that they're trying to drill down. Um, so it definitely makes it a little easier to work with. Now, the other option I came up with is I found uh, I had laying around. Uh, at some point, I had I converted... A report from a report into an HL7 v2 transitional into a CCR continuity of care um, so again it's just another another XML document so I should be able to do this the exact same way right just insert this XML the same way I did it before right so the script looks almost exactly the same uh, only it's doing a CCR document now which is a little bit different but again it's all just gonna end up in my in my couch DB right so Oops, it looks like that maybe didn't work. Let me go back and look. Oh, I only ran that one line, I guess. Let me just run this again. There we go. There's the CCR, right? So now that's all in there. And again, it's, you know, all the independent data elements are all there, right? So it's useful for us. We can use it later on. The last example I came up with is, um, you know, kind of an obscure one for, for our world in imaging. Uh, I just, I had an example of an EDI message. This is a 270, which is a request for insurance verification with EDI. Um, you know, whether or not this would actually sit in the VNA, who knows, right? But, you know, just to show pretty much, you know, any object that we might want to deal with, uh, we can we can extract metadata and get it into something like Couch for us to, you know, kind of connect all this data together, right? And, and you know, what's interesting about this is, is if you're, indexing and cataloging all these different types of data that are available um, it, it kind of gives you you know there could be interesting opportunities to do different kinds of data mining right so uh, you know this stuff could be useful again it's this foundation for you know these things like machine learning and AI that might be able to use some of this data for in ways that we didn't really think about right that researchers can think of or analysts or uh, and so forth right so how did I get this this one is a little bit more complicated uh, what I had to do here is, well, first I, I read my string first, right? That part is easy. So now I've got this string, which is basically just a bunch of characters, but it's a little like HL7 where you can delineate um, based on the tilde. The tilde delineates these segments, uh, and then these elements are delineated by these asterisks, right? Which is all defined in this in this standard. So I just extracted all that stuff to build myself a, uh, I'll run this. <coughs> I just basically built my own JSON string out of it. And you can see that here, right? So all the different elements within each segment uh, in a JSON string. And then I can, you know, just like everything else, I can insert that into my CouchDB. So now if I come back over here and reload, now you'll see that EDI, right? And there's all the stuff from that uh, insurance verification request. Okay. So lots of cool stuff, uh, you know, that I could get into my CouchDB and I just wanted to demonstrate uh, kind of how I did this proof of concept and a little extra on, you know, how we can work with CouchDB. Um, lots of other stuff to learn about these different platforms are all a little bit different. I, I chose to use CouchDB because uh, it's native JSON, which I knew I wanted to use because uh, I wanted to use something with JSON. Um, it was free, right? Uh, and I knew that there was a PowerShell library for it, and I knew I could use PowerShell to make a quick demonstration, uh, but certainly could have done something with Mongo or Hadoop or uh, Cassandra. 
Um, one thing I would mention is that uh, that I don't like about CouchDB is it's non-hierarchical. Um, so I think what I would want to use for DICOM data is a high, something that supports a hierarchical structure. So, you know, if you think about how, you know, even things like LDAP, right? Like LDAP is a database uh, at its heart um, that is that is a hierarchical database that is NoSQL, right? It's, a, it's an object-based database, right? And you could use something like LDAP to encode DICOM data, right, into this sort of uh, mineable database. So it'd be kind of neat to, to, as a project, just to kind of shoehorn DICOM data into LDAP or uh, or any other hierarchical database. So, I, and I would prefer hierarchical because da DICOM data at its heart really is hierarchical. Medical data really is hierarchical, right? You have a patient, a patient has a visit, a visit can have procedures, the procedures can have reports, and the procedures also have studies, and the studies have series. So everything kind of creates this tree of data that I think would uh, be a lot better for storing all this information and make it a lot easier to mine it. And also we'd have to store a lot less, right? Uh, because of that hierarchical structure. So that'd be kind of my next step if I were going to keep going with this uh, with this little project. So thanks for watching.